morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. Open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy. We are in chapter 6 this morning. This uh, is going to be our final exposition in this book of 1 Timothy. We've had a, uh, a blessed time as God has um, uh, uh, just taught me so much and helped me over the months, and I pray also for you, that we've been asking, uh, what, as the household of God, as each local church is, as God's household in the world, as His family, regenerated, reborn, filled with His Spirit, what are we to do and how are we to do it? Because the church uh, is supposed to be growing. Healthy things grow. We should be seeing healthy growth, though, not unhealthy growth. And what Paul is sending Timothy back to do is to kill the unhealthy growth and support and strengthen the healthy growth into the Ephesian church. Because Paul planted the Ephesian church about 10 years prior to this book. It was an explosive megachurch. Many were being saved. Thousands were being converted from dark arts, paganism, Artemis worship, Um, But in his absence, false teachers had come in, weak leaders had tolerated them, they'd risen to the top, they'd made room for female preachers in the church, false teachings had gone out, the gospel had been sidelined, which means necessarily that church had been distracted from her main task, the Great Commission, which Jesus gave to her and which Paul the Apostle uh, taught to her. So the church is in shambles, there's false teaching, there's bad leaders, there's disqualified leaders, there's non-Christians leading, church discipline isn't being done, apparently they're not paying their pastors. So all of this thing is going wrong. Paul sent Timothy, go back, set uh, set things straight, we don't want flabby, unhealthy, carnal growth in a church, you know, numbers at all costs, bring them in, give them whatever lollies underneath all of your seats right now, there's a key to a new car or there's lollies for the kids all over, the, you know, we'll just do entertaining, a unicycle and a zip line to keep everybody coming to church, that's flabby, unhealthy, cancerous church growth, but then there is the other side which sees no growth and that's called dying, when cells don't rejuvenate themselves. When churches don't replicate themselves through the preaching of the gospel and souls being converted, churches are unhealthy. Uh, The Ephesian church was in this sort of situation, a little bit of both camps. Timothy's job was to go back, establish some rules, make some order, restore and reform things back to the word of God and the handed tradition from Paul the Apostle. And this he did by God's grace. We've read all about it, uh, leadership, teaching, preaching, morals, uh, how the church as a family of God should treat each other. And we find ourselves here in verse 20 of chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20 says this, O oh, Timothy, O oh, Timothy, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Avoid it. Don't listen to it. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. May God bless his word in our midst this morning. The big idea is that Timothy, as the lead pastor in this church, and then the church after him, And then every pastor in history and every church after them needs to heed the warning, uh, obey the command, guard the deposit. Guard the deposit that God has entrusted to you. The other way we could phrase this is watch over the accounts that you've been given. Look out for scams. Uh, uh, Keep an eye on the, uh, the spendings going in or out of your accounts. Keep an eye on them because he's going to come back and expect safekeeping. The language of guard the deposit or watch the entrustment or look out for what has been given to you is really coming to us from history's uh, 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 behavior or um, uh, practice around the steward. Not steward, if you're here, welcome steward. But the stewards, the steward, meant to be somebody entrusted with something of value that belonged to somebody else. It would usually be noblemen, uh, a king, uh, a lord, an elder, uh, or, or a baron, or an emperor that they would give to one of their uh, underlings or one of their trusted people the, uh, the responsibility of supervising maybe a province. I'm going to entrust this province to you. Don't let civil war erupt. 
Don't let them all start burning the pictures of, of Caesar. Don't allow an uprising or a riot. Keep them under control. Sometimes they would entrust wealth to their steward. Look after this. Don't let it be stolen. I will be counting when I come back. Don't spend it. Look after it. Sometimes it was the language given to those stewards who looked after a child of royalty. That the father is needing to go away on, on military campaigns and so leaves his child with a steward. Guard them. Safe keep them, protect them, but make sure they grow and they, uh, as a mentor, grow into uh, my likeness. This language of guard the deposit is told to Timothy and uh, by, by extension also to us. Paul's telling Timothy, guard the deposit. See what you have, the position that you're in, as one of privilege but duty also. And you have a life to live. You have responsibilities to guard the family lands, to look after the family estate. One good example of this in English history is the man by the name of William Marshall. If you know your uh, English medieval history, you will know that his nickname, his title, the, 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 the name on the back of his senior jersey or his bumper sticker was The Greatest Knight. Now that that's a good name that aspire to that, uh, the greatest knight of England. And his story was that he was sort of born into a low nobleman family. That means his dad owned a couple of hundred acres maybe in England and looked after some agriculture and some people, but he had family estates to which he was entrusted at a fairly young age. And his father charged him, look after the family estates, protect the family land. And he took this charge so seriously that he really ri ri rose above others uh, of his equals and continued to be selected for greater and greater opportunities within the English um, uh, elderman sort of uh, uh, political sphere. The, the, the trick was that as he was asked to do more, he still had to keep an eye on his family estates. Because he was in such a strategic position, such a legacy sort of a, 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 a minded a position that other elders, other English people would want to come in and steal the lands off of him. He had to guard the family deposit. He had to look out for and protect the family uh, wealth and estates. But, but, but not only that, he was also having to look after the kingdom. Because eventually he was made a knight, and then he was made an elderman over a large province, some in Wales and some lands in, um, uh, in Normandy, basically France. And as the French were pushing into his lands in Normandy, as well as civil war erupting in England against the king, and other people trying to steal his lands, he was juggling all of these um, uh, uh, hats and balancing all of these acts in order to protect family estate, stand up for the king, put down rebellion, and push back the French back across the channel and out of his lands. And he was successful in doing it, all the while looking after the young king's son, for the king had died. So young Henry III, uh, William Marshall was made a regent over him to look after him and the kingdom until he came of age. He was then known because of his faithfulness in guarding his family, kingdom, and king's deposit, he was known as the greatest knight, the greatest example of self-sacrificing nobility. And it's this kind of mindset that Paul is calling Timothy to. If you're a little bit more holy, you'll want a biblical example. We can think of 2 Kings chapter 2. Sorry, 1 Kings chapter 2, where David, the, the great king after God's own heart, the, the, the king who had had many sins in his life, many failures, many uh, political uh, uh, mistakes, many family failures, many of his own sins, but, but knew God's promise that he who trusted not in himself he who trusted not in his own righteousness, but trusted that God is merciful and will not count your sins against you if you call on him. That King David who trusted in God's promise for salvation and was the uh, second king in Israel, but the first great king, the first king of the Davidic line, which would uh, be very symbolic of Israel. He was given a promise that if the sons after him as kings also walked according to God's ways, then the nation as a whole would thrive and be under God's blessing. This is what David charged his son Solomon with on his deathbed. I, I read it and I want to yell it, but it's an old dying man speaking it. So allow me to withhold my, my zeal. He says to his son on his deathbed, he says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. 
It's called toxic masculinity. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies as it is written in the law. A lot of people call that legalism. It's called being righteous. So that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. That the Lord may establish his word that he spoke to me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness, with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David had memorized the promise that God had made to him in the Davidic covenant, which was if he and his sons as kings obey God, the whole nation would thrive and no other empires or nations would take over Israel. For example, the Assyrians and the Syrians and the Babylonians and the, uh, the, the Greeks and the Persians and the Medes and the Chaldeans and then the Roman Empire. None of that would have happened, oh, if they just had a good and faithful king. And this is what David is saying to Solomon. It's not just about you and your personal walk with God and your personal sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. You must walk faithful because on your shoulders hangs the fate of the entire nation and God's glory in the earth, in and through the kingdom of Israel. I think psychologists would today call that an undue, heavy father's burden. I shouldn't have done this bad parenting, putting so much weight on your son. This is godly patriarchy, handing down this kind of order to his son. And this is exactly what Paul is doing. Paul has said in other parts of the book that Timothy is like his son. He calls him my son in the faith, his spiritual child. Your dad's not a believer, Timothy, I know, but I'm, you're like my son. And he says, you now are being entrusted with, if we can say, the kingdom of the church of Ephesus. You're being entrusted to charge to those leaders to walk faithful, or we're going to have a repetition of the present cycle, which is bad leaders, bad teaching, no salvations, no great commission. Jesus will shut down the church like he threatens to do in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus will never stop building his church globally, but he does shut down particular churches who fail to guard the deposit. So we need to ask, though, what is the deposit? What is he referring to here? Uh, The deposit, we could say, is a gift from God. The gift of God towards us is what he has deposited. See, a deposit is not earned. A deposit is not thought up. A deposit is not invented, is not made. It's received. God graciously gives to us something. Now, that's the things probably most powerfully that we've been deposited in the gospel is, uh, well, is, is regeneration, is being born again. The fact that we were sinners, dead in sin, loved iniquity, hated righteousness, enemies of God, and he gave to us a miraculous new birth, a being born again so that now we love righteousness from within. We understand the word of God. We desire to live for God and we understand the gospel and embrace Jesus as Lord. We have received also the Holy Spirit and the power to live a godly life. We have received salvation, forgiveness of sins and the inheritance of a future. That is part of our deposit. Paul's not saying anything against those. But on top of that, his emphasis seems to be that the deposit you are to guard, Timothy, and then all of us, The deposit to God is actually his calling and his ministry. The the ministry and the calling into that ministry. Because this whole book is about his leadership in the local church, his preaching ministry, and his watch over himself as a pastor, as an elder. So the emphasis that you need to guard, and that after Timothy, all of us, not only the leaders and pastors, but every Christian, is to... Guard the deposit. What is your deposit? We should say this. The deposit that God has given to you in this sense is the way God has called you to serve the Great Commission and how he has equipped you to fulfill it. How God has, fulf- has called you specifically to fulfill a part of the Great Commission and then how he has specifically equipped you to fulfill it. So in calling and in gifting, there is, a un- there is sort of a general and a specific element. Uh, In terms of our calling, there's a general calling on every Christian. Make disciples, plant churches, be a faithful church member, see the Great Commission go forward in your giving, your service, your prayers. That's general. There's also a general gifting that we all have the Holy Spirit. We all have the Word of God preserved in the Bible. We all have uh, the, the doctrine or the faith, Paul calls it, the system of theology called the Christian religion. We thank God for that. But there are also specifics in calling and specifics in equipping. 
The specifics of our calling will be, are you called to be a missionary cross-culturally? A pastor, elder, locally? Are you called to be a a business owner and builder? Are you called to be, well, what kind of business? Are you called to be an entrepreneur or a worker and employee? Are you going to be a church member here or in another church plant? These are all the specifics. And then in your equipping, there is also specifics. That you have a particular personality given by God, shaped by God throughout your life. You have a given set of spiritual gifts as well that God puts into you to build the church. You have specific and particular opportunities which are unique to you. This might be relationships or networks that you have to be able to see the gospel go forward. This might be like William Marshall, uh, the family you're born into and the unique opportunities that are uh, 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 allowed for you and given for you. This might be your resources and that you have wealth or uh, uh, people or uh, opportunities in order to leverage that for the Great Commission. So each one of us, in this sense, now as a pastor, it's really easy to take this as an application. Guard the deposit. Easy. I'm just like Timothy. I'm a little too young to be doing the job that I'm doing. Uh, People are still getting saved. God's really gracious. I'm preaching the church in a really sort of carnal world. That's easy for me to take an application. What about everybody else? Is there application for you? Yes, there is. Your ministry, your calling is the deposit that God has put in you. And it is that which you have the responsibility to guard like William Marshall over a family estate, like a steward over a wealth or a child put into your arms. You are to take up the sword of the Lord's battle, fight the good fight, and wage the good warfare. Here's a big idea. Guard the deposit. Well, we've talked about what the deposit is, the mindset we should have. Now the question becomes, what are we guarding it from? What are we guarding this deposit, this faith, this uh, theology, this word of God, this gospel, this, this spiritual gifting? What are we defending it from, guarding it from? And we can say, first of all, we are guarding it, and Timothy had to guard it in the Ephesian church from error. In, in a sense, these last two verses are really just a summary of the whole book. He introduces really nothing more that he hasn't said already. It really gives to us a, a fitting conclusion to the, whole, to the whole book, the whole sermon series. It, 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 he says, uh, guard the deposit, avoid irreverent babble that is no good for anybody, grace be with you. These are themes that have already been shooting out at us from the whole book. So here are some summaries of the book itself as to how we might obey. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. First of all, from error. As a pastor, it's incumbent upon me, and as the other elders uh, oversee, it's incumbent upon all of us to have a keen eye for error and have conversations with and have a heightened level of discernment so that we can see, notice, speak to, and correct error. Titus chapter 1 says uh, uh, that one of the requirements for an elder in a local church is to be the ability to correct error. Not just make people feel good, not just welcome people, have a big smile, nice jacket, funny jokes, right? We meet all of those here, but also, also, strict standard of teaching. A heart and a mind for correction that Paul spoke about in chapter one and said, the aim of this is love. We want to see people walk in godliness, walk under God's smile, and that means they need correction. People are being veered by false teaching. That means that here at Hope Church, there is an int- that you're probably going to be asked questions in your membership uh, interview or as uh, members of the flock here that you haven't been asked before by other churches. You haven't been asked such intense theological questions or, or discipleship questions or accountability questions, but we take care, a close watch, a discerning eye on the theology that is in a church. Chapter 4, verse 16 says, keep a close watch on the doctrine." Chapter 20 of the book of Acts, Paul said to the same church, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his blood. This is a necessary job of pastors, is to guard the deposit of the faith and the task and ministry of the church from error, bad theology, false teaching, and false gospels. It also means that pastors need the courage to address it. They need the courage to actually talk about what needs to be talked about. Timothy needed this. Paul's given him, the, uh, in this book, if you were in Ephesus, this is, the book is just a list of the most awkward things to ever talk about as a young pastor come into a dysfunctional church. 
Your favorite pastors are all heretics. Sorry about that. Um, the ladies need to stop preaching. They're not allowed to be leaders. That's going to go down well. You need to pay your elders more. Wow. Uh, uh, look after the widows better. And if you're not looking after your mother-in-law, who everybody loves, uh, you're not going to heaven. Right? Just, a, just this list of really brutal things to have to tell them. Uh, uh, how to do church discipline. That was in there too. Uh, waging the warfare. He really does uh, make it hard for Timothy. But Timothy needs the courage to address it. And so in chapter 4, Paul tells him, command and teach these things, Timothy. And so pastors need that. Or there's the love of subtleties and speculations and secrecies and insinuations that lead to error damaging the deposit. To guard the deposit means in keeping away from error, the pastor also needs it. Some pastors just love the most subtle, sneaky, uh, interesting, novel, uh, new, sometimes ancient genealogy things like, yeah, you know, we don't want to give a hundred, the hundredth lecture or, or, or sermon on justification by faith alone or, or Christ and all of that. Like, we want to get into the really interesting stuff, and so I'm glad you're all here. We're going to talk about how the lost tribes of Israel infilled and informed the political uh, 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 influence of Europe and how you might actually be a descendant of Abraham maybe and how that's really good for you and also how the Nephilim might be related to you and if if you get a DNA check, like, um, it sounds like I'm making stuff up. I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that. Guys, who just, they're, they're, they're so into theology. They're, they're bypassing what's actually written. Now they're into the caves. No, Paul calls that in verse 20, irreverent babble and contradictions that are falsely called knowledge. It doesn't matter that they've got a degree and a PhD and a D-min and everything else. It's irreverent babble. No, no, it's called a thesis. No, it's not. It's irreverent babble. Oh, oh but, but I looked into the archaeology, and I did brand new historical surveys, and it turns out exactly what we want to do sexually as a culture, Paul was actually okay with it. Wow, look at that. Discovery. He's got a doctorate. She's got a doctorate. Irreverent babble. Contradictions. Falsely called knowledge. In chapter 4, uh, he said, he called this myths, genealogies, and speculations. In verse 1, he called them irreverent, silly myths. And here he calls them false knowledge. The Greek word is gnosis. It's falsely called gnosis. He was addressing what would actually, it was only in its germinal st uh, uh, point at, this, at the time of his writing, but it would grow to become a fully-fledged oppositional religion to Christianity that was it not for God's grace would have overwhelmed the church, the early church. John has to write about it at the end of his life in the books of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and is this what becomes the religion, the cult of Gnosticism. And basically their big idea was Christian truth mingled and, and, and uh, uh, swirled with Greek philosophy helps us to understand that, yes, yeah, some people wrote the Bible and there's some things in there, but the real spiritual ones who will live on in the future are those who don't just read the Bible, but have received the angelic touch in the mind, had the ascending, illuminating experience, and are now in another level of Christianity. We live in the spiritual realm. We are godlier than you. We are holy. We know more than you. And I can't actually tell you because you don't have the light within. So if you question it, you're necessarily going to hell. Yeah, that's what it's like. But we are the Gnostic ones. And it's the sort of thing that actually does rear its ugly head all throughout church history over and over again. A protected class of Christians who are closer to God than you and they can't defend what they believe from Scripture, but that's okay because they have extra revelations. And if you want the touch from God, you can come to them too. And they'll get it for you. And the reason you can't get over your sin is probably because demons are holding you back. But I can help you again. And, and maybe paying your way to my account would help me help you. We a bit, bit of prid quo quo here. But nonetheless, there's the you, there's the us, there's the writings in Scripture, but then there's what we know in the Spirit. Even just see some of you thinking that, yeah, I, I heard that. I didn't know it was called Gnosticism, thought it was called enter former church here. Yeah, it pops up all the time. God did not preserve this warning because it was going to expire when Gnosticism fell away. This is the constant, uh, people say, Scripture is not only the story of what happened, it's the story of what always happens. Gnosticism always happens. So-called knowledge always infects churches. And so, 
Timothy must guard the deposit from that kind of error. He must also guard the deposit from moral reproach, meaning guard the deposit of the faith, the church, the gospel, the preaching, the the people entrusted to you. Guard them from moral failure and sin that will lead them and the world to think, what good is this teaching if even the leaders and the pastors live in such moral failure? Guard the deposit from that. Run your race To the end, Paul will say. It's not good enough to get old, then lean back and sin. To have some wins in ministry, then sleep with your intern. It's not good because some people will be very good on doctrine. And there's not error in their ministry. They're guarding it from error. But they're not guarding it from reproach. They fall into sin. They welcome sin. They tolerate sin. I teach the five points. I teach the five solas. I've got a confession of faith. Don't mind her, she's just my secretary. We we have private meetings, it's okay. Guard it from error, guard it from reproach, guard it also from idleness. Paul is told Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself. Train yourself for godliness. Flee sins and pursue righteousness. Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. Guard it from error. Guard the deposit from reproach in moral sin. But you know what? Some churches, they're so doctrinally pure and there's, I don't think there's any sinners left in their church. They just, they are pure people. They are concrete, set 1920s culture. No modern music. They're so pure. But they're dying the death of idleness. When's the last of baptism? And maybe somebody coming to faith. Whoa, whoa. A new person? Are you kidding me? No, we're a pure True church. Why do we want sinners coming in? (laughs) Well, why is it a problem that nobody's getting saved? We're saved. We're the church. It's all good. I think job's done. Ever been been at that church? It's the error. It's the it's the temptation that if the devil can't get you on on error and he can't get you on moral reproach, he'll just stop you from doing anything. Sitting right still, resting on your laurels, looking at the things that have happened in the past, the great church building we got, these goals got met, we sent that many pastors, now lock the doors, close it out so nothing goes wrong before Jesus gets back. In other words, Paul's telling Timothy throughout this whole book, and he's telling us as a church, the devil is always running a play. There's always something going on. You you find doctrinally, no false teachers popping their head, watch the closets, watch the internet search history, watch the moral side. Oh, oh, that's good. We're we're thriving in righteousness, walking, loving God's law. It's making us wise. We're, We're leading. Watch the speculations and watch the idleness that will make doctrinal purity and moral purity the end point. It doesn't matter if anybody comes to church. These are errors, these are deadly things, uh, idleness, keep it guarding the deposit. I say this because the deposit we've given is not an idle, still, stationary deposit. The deposit is the life-giving, momentum-building, glorious, Holy Spirit-empowered gospel and great commission, which is by necessity moving forward and marching to God's glory. So if we have this deposit, we need to, be, need to make sure that we're not like the, um, the 18-year-old child of, of the Marine who went away on a tour and for three years he was going to be gone and told his son, my Mustang is here, it's in the garage, I don't want to come, you're not allowed to drive it yet, uh, I don't want to come home to it wrapped around a telephone pole or I'll wrap you around a telephone pole, I don't want to come back to it crushed or you'll be crushed. I don't want to come back to it scratched and destroyed and, and burned. I, or you will be scratched, crushed, and, and burned. Please, son, look after it. And so he goes away, and he comes back from his tour, and his son's now 21. and said, Dad, Dad, the car's fine. I, I didn't do anything. And the father walks in, and there's the Mustang. Hasn't been touched, hasn't been dusted. The, the diesel's still sitting there, now foul. Uh, corrosion and rust ruining the engine, the oil sitting, ruining the parts it's in, uh, rats making nests all through. Now, now he did nothing. And that is, at the same time, his safety and his demise. He needed to keep it running, keep it moving without destroying it. And some Christians are crippled by fear of mission. And it's actually to those people that Jesus tells the parable in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, we might call it the parable of, of the deposits. But, but he tells the story, he goes, you know, here, here's what the kingdom of God is like. A rich man gives five talents, a lot of money, to one guy. 
He gives two talents, a fair bit of money, to one guy, and he gives one talent, plenty of money, to one dude. And he goes away for a time, and he's going to come back. And he says, look after it for me. Turn an interest. And off he went, and he came back and interviewed the first, and he says, I tell you what, I made investments. I purchased at good times. I sold. I bought. I made five on top of the five. I have an inordinate amount of money. He says, this is where we get the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. Goes to the guy with two, and he goes, I also doubled. Market's good, bought, sold, traded. Here's another two on top of your two, a great amount of money. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And then Jesus asks the guy who had one, and, and obvi- uh, sorry, the leader asks the guy who had one, and obviously the whole market, it's, it's basically going to double your income uh, and double, double your investment kind of uh, 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 measure, so this must be good, he's going to get me one. That's the pattern of the market at the moment, and so he asks the man, where's my two? I gave you one, where's my two? And he says, oh no, I know what you're like, you're harsh, you're mean, you're brutal, um, I got afraid of your judgments. I took your coins and I didn't ruin it. I didn't scratch it. I didn't devalue it. I dug a hole, put it into the ground. And if you will just help me, we'll dig it up and we'll bring it out together and you can have your one back. And what does Jesus say? The leader says, he says, you're faithless. You're foolish. You should have known to work instead. And he uses this eternal damnation language. He says, you'll be cast out into the darkness. Jesus is saying, He's speaking to, he's urging Christians who have been given the deposit of the gospel in a church with the Bible and the Holy Spirit and a calling and a ministry, do not die the death of idleness and negligence. See yourself busy. Put your hand to the plow. Work and labor, labor and work and strive to see the gospel go forward, the local church supported, souls won. This is our purpose. The devil is always running a play. If he can't get you on truth, if he can't get you on moral purity, maybe he'll get you on being stationary. So don't be clever and invent new things. Don't be proud and tolerate sins. And do not be self-satisfied and tolerate idleness while billions perish. This is the command of Paul. Guard the deposit from truth, from sin, from idleness. Timothy, teach that church to move by God's grace. But look at verse 21. By professing it, okay, by following the genealogies, the myths, the lies, the contradictions, the irreverent babble, the wives' tales, the philosophies, that's all words he's used in 1 Timothy. By chasing that and becoming useless and idle, by doing that, Paul is saying, some have swerved from the faith. That's like you you get from, uh, uh, you cross the channel, now you're on mainland Europe, and you say, where's half the fleet? Where is everybody? We left with 100 ships, we're 20. I know that's not half, forgive me. Uh, We lost many, they swerved. Caught in a storm, moved south, now they're in France. Moved north, now they're in Daneland, the Vikings have eaten them now. Where's half the fleet? They swerved. They, they, They read the stars wrong, they moved in the wrong direction, they didn't make it. This is the reality. This is not a theoretical warning. This is a reality in the life of the church. Paul has even started in chapter one by warning Timothy, remember, some ships have wrecked themselves on the rocks of heresy and godliness. Their names were Hymenaeus and Alexander. They were your former lead elders. Now they're just a pile of rubbly timber that's being inhabited by by starfish and sharks. They're a wreck. It actually happened. I wonder, I wonder if we would even do the, the tragic thing to ourselves right now and just try and think in our own life. Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you've been added to it by God's grace later. But even in your life, you had friends that you thought were surpassing you in godliness that just fell away. People you thought were just solid, rock foundation. They were, they were in it, and now they're gone. They preferred Stupid, irreverent myths, genealogies, lies, or sins like, uh, like, like, like adultery or, or, or theft or Roman Catholicism or Greek Orthodoxy or, 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 or all kinds of different. There's hooks everywhere. It's a perilous, perilous journey from here to heaven. There are unnumbered, uncountable things that might trick, tempt, destroy you into shipwreck. Guard the deposit is our Almost impossible command. 
the journey from here, perilous in all of its ways, goodness me, if these men trained by Paul himself didn't make it, what hope is there for you trained by the elders here? I've seen those guys. I know the pastor who preaches here. Doesn't shine a light to Paul the apostle. What hope is there? The last line in the epistle is what hope there is. Paul says, grace be with you. God's grace be with you to guard the deposit and see fulfilled all those things that God has commanded in 1 Timothy. Grace be with you. That is our greatest need. And my friends, that is God's free gift to us. Exactly what we need, we have by God's marvelous grace. And what we need is God's grace. Grace means a free gift. It really is similar in language to the deposit. Something given freely to you. God's grace towards us is what we need. Because grace does more. We've got four things here that grace does. Grace does more than just forgive. Some of us hear grace and we think, yes, I don't have to pay for my past sins. But grace is more than that. Grace does forgive, but grace does more than that. God's grace, his undeserved gift towards us, his grace, his, his, his loving kindness to bestow benefits on us, that, that inclination and that covenant love in God, his grace does more than just forgive. It also empowers. It isn't just a, a declaration of legal forgiveness. It is also a presence by which he he, he, he mediates and he pours into us his own divine power. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says this. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Isn't it silly that some people try and say, I'm under grace, I can keep sinning? No, you're not. Grace trains righteousness. That righteousness doesn't earn God's forgiveness. You get that in grace. But the grace that forgives also trains you into righteousness. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. That means whatever need you have in the Great Commission warfare, whatever need you have to obey the command, guard the deposit, Protect your family estate. Stand at arms at the front door of the household of God. Whatever need there is, you have it in God's grace. If it is energy and zeal and effort and replenishment and refilling and refueling week by week through strenuous labor, you will have it. If it is strength to say no to temptations because God has given you riches or resources or opportunities that offer a lot of temptations for you in this world, you will have the grace to resist those temptations. If you have the trial of being married to an unbeliever or or struggling through persecution from family members or, or workmates or people from your old religion, whatever it may be, you will have the grace required because God's grace trains you to renounce ungodliness and follow a godly, righteous, upright life. God's grace be with you to preserve you, to empower you in guarding the good deposit. But God's grace also preserves. There are some things which empower, right, diesel fuel, but they don't preserve things. Don't go putting your pickles or your bread into diesel to preserve it. It won't work. It will corrode it. But God's grace at the same time empowers us explosively while preserving us, sustaining us to the end. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, Paul says to the same guy, Timothy, in the same light, suffer for the gospel, he says, I am not ashamed of my chains, for I know in whom I have believed, and I am convinced, listen to this, that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. I am not ashamed of my chains because I know that God can guard the deposit. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, you guard the deposit, O Timothy, entrusted to you. See the the dual nature of that? God can and will guard the deposit he's given me. Therefore, Christian, guard the deposit that he has given you. 
Well, I can't. What a perilous, impossible journey from here to heaven. You can because God is and God will. Well, if God is and God will, I don't need to do it. No, his word says, guard the deposit. He is guarding. His, one of the ways in which he guards is stirring and stoking us up to a, a sense of nationalistic, in a Christian sense, a spiritual fidelity and loyalty to our king. He stirs that in us. That is how the king protects his borders, is by his soldiers. No power of hell then, we can sing, as we just did. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. God will guard that deposit in me. He will not let me go. And because he does that, I can be stirred to guard the deposit. God's grace empowers. God's grace preserves. God's grace also rewards. God's grace rewards. This is all in the concept of God's grace be with you to guard the deposit. He will empower you to guard the deposit. He will preserve you in guarding the deposit. And he will reward you for guarding the deposit. Now, now God's grace rewards. That's not how we think about it often. Isn't it God's, God's grace that forgives and all that? But God's justice rewards. When I get to heaven, finally, and I'm dead, I will bring my list and God will pay me what I'm owed. Sacrifices, I tithed. I gave a lot. I gave a lot to the building fund. I expect that to, I've written down here in fine print, Paid in full, you said 100 or 1,000 fold. I've circled 1,000 fold option, thank you God. I also uh, suffered with my unsaved spouse. I put up with being fired from a job. I moved from my homelands because of the persecution. I, anyway, these are my sacrifices. You can pay me now, God. Here's my owings, my rewards. But God's rewards to us, and I know no one would say, speak that way, but maybe we, we tend to think that way accidentally. God's rewards in heaven to us are not him paying us what we're owed, uh, Augustine said, it's like God putting gems on the crowns that he gave us in the first place. He's rewarding the good works in us that he came up with and put into us. It's like a, a, a father giving his kid five bucks because there's a Father's Day sale on. The kid comes home with weird paper mache key ring with a whistle, maybe a whistle, something dangling off the bottom. Happy Father's Day bad, right? They write, they write it all wrong. I mean, oh, thanks. He goes, you're welcome. Like, well, think of how wealthy you are now, that you have this jangly keychain thing. You're welcome. And of course, the father may be preferred to just keep the five bucks. Not me, not me. I'm, I'm not that kind of dad. But, but you are definitely not richer than before you gave them the five bucks. It, it's God has given us gifts. We work for him in life. We come back and he graciously, lovingly smiles over all of our works, but none of it didn't originate in him. He did this in us, and then on the final day, he also gifts his own graces with rewards for us to enjoy. What a marvelous thought of God's grace. And this has been a constant motivation for Paul in this letter, as he explains to Timothy. In chapter 6, verse 19, he told them, Store up treasure for yourselves as a good foundation for the future. In chapter 6, verse 14, he says, This is the great reward and the great hope, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. Think of that day when the foundation of riches and rewards are poured out on you in the presence of Jesus. Or in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. There is a day coming. Here is a motivation to guard the deposit without failure, without relent, and without quarter. Here is a motivation. There is a day of reward coming at Jesus' return when we will be given crowns and rewards for all that we sacrificed and all that we labored and accomplished in the guarding of the deposit of God. And fourthly, Although this should be first in our minds, the grace of God saves sinners. Grace be with you. Have you sinned? In your attempts to guard the deposit, have you been overly zealous and insulted wiser older men? Have you insulted and gotten in the face of widows that needed help and you, you gave them a lecture? Have you been heavy-handed with other members in the flock or your flock as a pastor? Have you been negligent and not spoken up when you should have? Have you been lazy in the household of God, expecting all the other kids to do the chores and you sit back and play spiritual Xbox? 
Have you failed in some measure to guard the deposit in the presence of God and his, uh, God the Father and Christ Jesus and all the holy angels? Have you failed in some measure? Oh, praise God, there is grace with you. There is grace for you. There is grace from God to all of us. The way where you failed to guard the good deposit perfectly, God has given grace and he forgives our every failure. But it's not true that God saves Christians, is it? Some people are here today and you've been invited, maybe the first time in church, all you're hearing you know you're not a Christian. And you hear all of this, God, God's grace forgives. Right? That father, God, is very forgiving to the children in his family. And that's true, he is. That's what we we're just saying. We fail, he's gracious. He keeps on renewing us. But at the beginning of this book, Paul doesn't say Christ Jesus came into the world to save Christians. He says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, what is it, hope? Sinners. Sinners meaning criminals, rebels, defiled, vile souls, enemies of God, uh, uh, blasphemers, adulterers, fornicators, uh, thieves, liars, murderers, all of it. Paul says Christ Jesus came into the world to save that type of person. Uh, often I have friends I invite to church and they'll say something like, I, I, no, Jesus isn't for me, I'm a sinner. No, 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 church ain't for me, I'm a sinner, Christianity's great for you, I'm a sinner, and I have to, I have to tell him what, a, what kind of lot you guys are so he feels welcome, right? Or rather, my, my usual go-to is, you're misunderstanding everything. Jesus did not come for Christians. Jesus did not come for the saved. Jesus did not come for the righteous. Jesus did not come for the healed. Jesus did not come for the healthy. He came for the unhealthy and forgiven sinners he calls Christians, that is that if you're here today and you're thinking, well, it must be good to be a Christian and get forgiveness, but man, my sin is like MA uh, uh, at the worst, at the, e, at the, at the least, uh, R-rated, X-rated kind of sins. I don't think church folk think about, even know about that kind of sin. That kind of forgiveness God doesn't have. I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. Jesus loves you far more than you can ever comprehend in that he has died, that you would have the opportunity to be forgiven of all of your sins, all of them the ones you would never dare, maybe even you, you feel wrong remembering them in church, the ones you hope to bury under alcohol, uh, years and labor and just keeping yourself, but you don't want them to come back up into your, into your psyche. Those ones Jesus died for. Jesus came into the world to save sinners and Paul says, I was the foremost, I was the worst, but in me, God displayed his grace so that later people can be filled with the hope that if God saved Paul, a Christian killer, then maybe there's enough grace for me. And that is true for you today. If you are lost, if you are sinful, if you are defiled and you don't have hope that at Jesus' return, you will get rewards and love and grace, but you will be judged, then today Jesus says, I died for you. I died for the likes of you, that you may believe Call on him who died on the cross for your sins. Call on Jesus who rose again in resurrection, sits in heaven now and will come back eventually and judge everybody. Call on him now and say, Jesus, please pay for my sins. Please forgive my sins. Please make me a new person. I don't wanna live the life I'm currently living. The grace of God be with you to save you today if for the first time you are gonna put your faith in him. It is a dangerous thing to live the Christian life what a perilous, perilous thing spiritual warfare is. Well, by spiritual warfare, I just mean the biblical Christian life. What a perilous journey it is from here to heaven. Battling Satan, the world, and the flesh. But with Christ Jesus, our hope, and God, our Savior, we will conquer. With our faith firmly planted in Jesus Christ and our effort arising up from the Holy Spirit's deposit within us, we will be fruitful. We will guard the deposit and we will fight the good fight to the glory of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the one dead for sinners and alive forevermore. Praise God. Let's pray. Father God, the deposit that you have given to any one of us is beyond imagination and beyond comprehension. It uh, stretches our, our thoughts and our hearts and our souls just to think about it. The, the presence of your spirit in our hearts, uh, new life, new mind, new heart, new eyes from our previous deadness and sinfulness. 
You have, you have raised us up to a station and an adoption and a family and a household that we can never imagine. And these, this is our lot. You've given to us the word. You teach us by your spirit. You give to us the church. You give to us a calling. You call us to the great commission. Father God, we thank you for these things. We ask that in all of your giftedness, in all of your grace, your grace would not just bestow gifts, but also preserve us as you promised to do. We don't want to read the word as a mere flat historical document. We want to read it as a covenant document, a, a, a letter from God to us, his people. And we want to take you up on this promise and beg of you and implore of you, please God, do this in our midst. Make us faithful to the end. Make us persevere and preserve us. Empower us, Lord God, that we would guard the deposit from the rot of error and from the stain of sinful reproach coming upon your name, and also from the deadness of idle neutrality that doesn't take ground. Father God, please make us a battalion moving for the sake of the Lord Jesus, empowered by his Holy Spirit. And we pray, therefore, that in this moment, you would grant a sinner, multiple sinners, new life, resurrection power in their soul, a faith that can trust in and call on Jesus Christ and know that they are forgiven of their sins. We pray this, Lord God, in Jesus' marvelous and mighty, wonderful name. And everybody said...